That guy's just waiting on the edge of the trail for anybody <laughs> who gets close enough. He's like, mmm, tasty parkgoers from all around the world. It's international cuisine for him. Welcome to the East Coast's largest national park, containing 1.5 million acres of subtropical wilderness in southern Florida. This unique landscape contains so many different habitats, but also containing the largest wetlands in the world, receiving 60 inches of rain per year. This vast area is home to many birds, reptiles, fish, whatever your nightmares can dream up, you can find here in the Everglades. I ran into creatures I have never seen before, but I also ran into some familiar faces. I'm trying to record a video here. I, here, wide on the set. Wow. I was trying to record some flying fish, but I got distracted by someone. Mm hmm. You know what you did? Birds. Also, are they called flying fish? I don't think I was prepared for what I was walking into. I walk into the Everglades Visitor Center and it says that it's home to the largest snake in North America. I'm just starting to mentally process the fact that I'm gonna see alligators. Why? Why do I do this to myself? What am I doing? This is all... <laughs> that snake I was referring to is called the Eastern Indigo Snake. These non-venomous snakes can grow up to nine feet long. And I urge you, do not look up pictures of these things if you value your sleep. With the breeze and the clouds, it's actually kind of nice. But then just thinking that there could be snakes in this really tall grass just, you know, doesn't do it for me. Nope. I'm so sorry about this, but the hat had to come out. This video is quickly turning into an Avoid the Everglades short film. But spoiler alert, I had a safe and wonderful snake-free visit in the Everglades for three days. So let me shed some light on the absolutely stunning landscapes you are free to explore on your way through the park. The first type I encountered was the freshwater marl prairie. These marshy areas are identified by shorts growing sawgrass and are home to invertebrates, tadpoles, and even some fish. You are able to view these areas from a boardwalk trail Luckily, because it doesn't look like fun to walk through that. I'm not used to the heat. This feels super jungly. This is scary. I'm expecting like a snake to fall out of a tree or something. I want my mummy. In the areas where the elevation is only slightly higher, you can find hardwood hammocks. These areas are typically safe from flooding, allowing a variety of trees and taller vegetation to survive. It felt like I was walking through a jungle as the air was humid and I was surrounded by tropical trees. Like, look at how big that is. Everything is big, scary. And I'm small, I'm not scary. <laughs> Why am I doing this? I think it's easy to form a false sense of security in national parks just because you're visiting doesn't mean bad things can't happen to you. Yeah, I'm definitely feeling very aware of that today. I've never been so intrigued and afraid at the same time. Don't knock it. In the southern portion of the park, you finally hit the ocean as you reach the tip of southern Florida. And of course, like a good big sister would, I teased her about it. So, there you go. I guess I was kind of expecting there to just be alligators everywhere, but I guess that's... Not that I say it out loud, it doesn't make sense, but I'm a little bit disappointed. But yeah, hopefully I'll see a gator soon. Although this is kind of creepy by myself. While the park is made up of wetlands containing moving water, there were areas where the water pooled to form ponds. And this is where I got some bird watching in during the early morning hours, at an area called Eco Pond. You 
guys don't freak out but i think i just saw flamingos see some pink birds over there. Let's go. I don't think that those are flamingos, which means that there are multiple pink birds out there, which means that I don't know much at all about birds. The pink birds are called rosate spoonbills. You can kind of make out from this footage that the tips of their beaks is shaped like a spoon, which helps them find food in shallow water. They eat crabs, crawfish, and small fish, which contains pigments that actually turns their feathers pink. Next to the pond, there was a coastal prairie, which looked very different from the other sawgrass prairie we saw earlier, because it is made up of these neon green succulents that are able to survive in salty waters that get cyclically brought to the area by hurricanes. Those hardy plants can withstand the salty and dry conditions in this part of the park. This park is home to so many different types of birds, and I will not attempt to name them all, but it was fascinating to watch how each bird had unique features like long curved beaks, long necks, tall legs, and all different fishing styles depending on their diet. I could have stayed there for hours, but I was on the hunt to see my first gator. Also, quick side note, the best part about Florida is that it's so flat. I was averaging 50 miles per gallon in my little Corolla while cruising through the park, which I was way too excited about. Anyways, I made my way north in search of fresh water, which brought me to Anhiga Trail. I definitely pronounced that wrong. This is the best spot for seeing all types of wildlife. And this is where I spotted my first alligator. Now the real question is, is it an alligator or is it a crocodile? You, like me, probably learned the difference back in middle school, but have since long forgotten. So here's a brief refresher. Alligators can survive in fresh water. They are dark in color, and they range from 8 to 11 feet long. While crocodiles are grayish green in color, they live in salt water, and they can grow as long as 20 feet. Yes, the man upstairs made a model for both types of water. So you have to be alert in every body of water you step in. The good news for North Americans is that alligators are only found in warmer climates from North Carolina down to Florida. And north of that, you just have to deal with bears. Fun. My heart rate has gone up like a thousand percent. <laughs> so freaky. These guys look like me when I'm sunbathing all sprawled out like <laughs> Look, they're just hanging out right there. Um, so we saw alligators and they said that they're very, very mellow, low energy during the day. They just sort of sunbathe and then at nighttime is when they're more active for in the early mornings and the night times is when they are more active. So we'll just avoid that. This trail was awesome because it brought you out into the water where I was able to view fish and I also watched this little turtle try to eat a flower. I must have stood there for five minutes watching this turtle try to get the right angle to eat this flower. I feel bad saying this, but after two minutes of watching it, it just started getting funny. As the little turtle would circle around the flower, reach its head out trying to get that sweet, sweet, tasty flower. The turtle finally got it in the end, but it was painful and funny to watch. The whole time I just wanted to pick the flower and give it to the struggling turtle. That wasn't the only turtle I saw. I also saw the Florida softshell turtle, which can be identified by their pointy nose. I'm not a turtle expert, but this one seemed to be trying to dig up some loose dirt, maybe to make a nest. It was the beginning of the reproduction season after all. This turtle would send dirt flying through the air hitting a few people walking along the trail in the process. This trail was an incredibly cool way to get up super close and personal with wildlife. Look at how big this bird is just hanging out on the trail. Oh yeah, and then it flew right at me, which was terrifying. You know the statistic that women live longer than men? I apologize to my male viewers, this is not an accurate reflection of you all, 
but I have a story to share about an alligator lounging in the middle of the trail. These guys, who looked like they were in their early 40s, were scheming on how to run past the alligator blocking the trail, while their wives urged them to just go back around the boardwalk without the threat of alligators because it was only a few extra minutes to walk around. But these stubborn guys decided to run quickly past this alligator, despite myself and their wives advising against it. The three of us women stood there, flabbergasted, as these two guys ran in front of an alligator. And the women walked around the long way on the safe boardwalk. That's the end of the story. Take from that what you will. Unfortunately, the Everglades has somewhat of a tragic recent history. During the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s, the United States experienced rapid population growth and technological growth, leading to the development of these untouched wetlands. You can't build on wetlands, so people began to drain these lands in order to develop them, destroying the ecosystem in the process. Luckily, in the 1920s, individuals realized the long-term effects this can have on the area and sought legislation to preserve this area of the world. And in the 1940s, the National Park was established and recovery efforts began. The wetlands began to recover from the interference. Now the Everglades is home to a ton of threatened and endangered plants and animals. But as long as the park is protected and respected by everyone, we will hopefully be enjoying this unique ecosystem for years to come. I wonder if they would like a nice New England chowder.